This is Art 364, Part 13. This is this one is about the uh, the Impressionists. Uh, this painting is by Claude Monet, uh, and it was exhibited at a, a show, uh, the first show of the Impressionists in in 1874. Last time I talked about how the 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 Academy had uh, rejected a whole lot of of artists in the uh, Paris Salon of 1863, and so and it caused a, an uprising, a, a lot of protests among artists who who were refused uh, from for that exhibition. So they had a uh, the establishment allowed them to have an exhibition uh, just for those who had been refused, and uh, Manet was was among them, and and there were there were many artists who were among them, um, and and you know in subsequent years uh, for the next decade. Uh, they continue to uh, protest and 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 uh, you know ask for another uh, gallery like that, another uh, an opportunity to show their work uh, outside the you know because the, they continue to refuse uh, people every year and uh, uh, but they were they didn't they weren't allowed that and by 1874 a, a new generation of uh, of artists had come up and. They decided, uh, because the, the academy was not letting people in who were not, you know, accepted by the academy. Uh, they decided to get together and uh, write a manifesto and be a, a more cohesive group than the than the realists were, and and decide to you know have their own shows, and among them, uh, you know, were the ones who we call we call now the, the impressionists, uh, though there were they included other artists besides them, but they were all like-minded in that they wanted to uh, uh, separate themselves from the, from the academy. When the show opened, uh, it was widely criticized, especially by critics from the academy uh, who, looked, who looked at these works and saw them uh, as, you know, as, as far removed from what uh, you know, the, the academy thought was good. Uh, this painting was especially uh, criticized uh, because it's the sort of thing that you know a, a, an academic painter might have in their studio as a kind of a study, uh, something that is the first thoughts on a picture. Uh, but since it's a landscape, and the academy didn't really care that much for landscapes, or in this case, seascapes, uh, it, it it is something of, of no value at all. You know, it's it's unfinished. It's um, it's just what they would call the first impression of, of the first idea, the first um, um, study. And so because the Academy only thought of, of works of art as being finished, highly polished, you know, works that are, you know, one spends, uh, you know, a year essentially making something where it's, where they, you know, you put lots and lots of work into studies, uh, uh, all kinds of preparation, and then when you make the painting, it's it is, you know, you don't turn it in until it's absolutely perfect in every way. If that is your aesthetic, if that is if that is what you want and you think of as as art, then something like this is 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 a, is a worthless thing, and to exhibit it as a as a finished work is just you know antithetical to the academy. And so they um, in in the uh, in the critique. They use the term impressionism, uh, meaning this is just an impression, and they kept using the word impression as a uh, as a, as a put down uh, for for this for the entire exhibit. And this would be the most uh, because the name of this picture is Impression Sunrise. Uh, they were using that as a way to uh, to put them down as a derog as a derogatory term. But the impressionists took the term as 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 their their label thereafter, uh, in order to uh, to show that yes, it is an impression, and that that is exactly what they're what they're after, because in their manifesto, what they stated that they they wanted to do in their art was, uh, you know, essentially opposite of what the what the academy wanted. Um, they're when they're they're thinking that it, that a painting was. Um, that an artist is 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 not painting the 
the objects. He's not reproducing those, those objects that he's seeing uh, to make a picture from, that he's painting the light from those objects. It's the impression or the, the uh, perception. And, and so that they're more like, almost like scientists who are looking at the light coming from objects and studying that light and reproducing that on a painting and, and you know, making something that is about the paint and about the color, not about the, the content of the subject. So when you look at this, um, what you see is a, a lot of broken brush strokes. It is very messy looking, and uh, though it's very clearly a uh, you know kind of a realistic image of what it would look like in a you know early morning, uh, looking out over um, the the harbor at the Le Havre uh, in France, where Monet painted this. Uh, and, and, and you can see it. it's, you know, on a foggy morning where the sun is coming up and it's, and everything is hazy. Um, it actually is kind of realistic of that. It, it is what you would see there. Uh, things would not be clear. And, and so, you know, the, the broken light from the, from the water, uh, is perfectly illustrated by little broken brush strokes here. Uh, little, little, little dabs of paint, dabs of paint for the reflection of the, uh, orange sun in the water and all of this haziness and so of, of you know boat mass and thing you can see it all you know it, 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 it all makes perfect sense except you can see the brush strokes you can see a little bit of say the, the the canvas underneath and this wasn't painted in a studio you know painstakingly it was painted outdoors and that was one of the things that the that the impressionist how they differed from the academic picture painters who all painted their paintings in, in a studio, is that they would go out into the landscape with easels and, you know, uh, a portable easels and, and the new paint tubes, which had uh, come, come on the market in 1841, I believe. And, and, uh, and, and they were able to, to, to work outside, you know, sort of like Corot. And they, they thought of Corot as sort of a, uh, as a, as a, as a mentor for, for their group, and you know that that being able to go go out into the landscape and paint, it's called plain air. Um, that they, they valued, and that the the painting that you get is much more spontaneous, and and much more alive, and it's more about that the impression that you get when you first see something and you respond to it and put the paint down on the canvas. That that uh, spontaneity, the, the 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 energy that comes from that, is what they're after. And it's just completely antithetical to, to what the academy would, would want. So that's why they were rejected, and that's why this first, first show was panned. But the public uh, liked them, and they had several exhibits over the course of a, a decade or so, and, and many of them uh, showed in those, in, those, uh, in those exhibitions, and they became more and more popular. And the whole idea of, of rebelling against the academy gained much more momentum so that by the end of the decade, or actually but by the end of the, of the 1800s, the academy had lost and uh, you know all of its all of its power. So that's that's Monet and it's, it's not entirely a, a, a typical one. Here's a, a typical sort of thing that, that Monet would do. Um, this is a, a, the facade of Rouen Cathedral and uh, I can show you this one. And this one, let me zoom back out. See, notice that they're seen from the same point of view, but the colors change and the light changes. There's another one. Another one. And another one. You see a pattern here. The, the artist, um, you know, I think he, he, he got a, a hotel room or something across the street from the, from the, uh, uh, from the cathedral, and he looked out the window, and he could see it, and he just painted it uh, many different times over the course of several days. Um, and looking at the light that comes from the cathedral at different times of day, under different you know weather conditions, whatever uh, it's a foggy morning or, or or whatever that the that it changes color, and so he's as you see from from this series. That he's not so much concerned about the cathedral itself, as or, or representing the, the cathedral as a subject, 
but he wants to paint the light that comes from the cathedral. He wants to see, uh, to, to, to have the response, the painting be his response to the different ways light uh, works over the surface. You know, when you look at the thing about a cathedral, it has lots and lots of, of opportunities for light to play over a surface to create light and shadow. And the shadows, notice, are not the same color as the, um, as, as the parts that is in light. Uh, if you have the part that is in light as this color and you add black to it, it would lose its chroma, it would, its saturation uh, in the shadows. But instead of adding black to make something darker, he uses a different hue, a darker hue for the, for the darks. And one of the one of the things that that the impressionists had in common, or many of them did, was that uh, not using black. Because if you're going to if your if your idea is to paint the light from something, then black would be the absence of that light. And since there's never any complete absence of light, you never should use black. You should use some other uh, darker uh, hue, so that the 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 saturation doesn't doesn't reduce. If you add if you take a, a, a bright color and you add black to it, it reduces its saturation. Same if you add white to it. So that's that's Monet's thing is that he, uh, you know, he painted the light. He 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 would study. There's there's several series like these, like this one, uh, where he did the same subject over and over at different times of day, and so this is this is entirely a different world from the academic tradition, because in the academic tradition, often it's the content that is the most important thing, the story being told, whether it's a religious story or a mythological story or a historical story, all those things is that they're high, highly valued because of those, that's what the art is doing. It's telling a story and they want to tell it in a certain formal way. And that's not what's going on with the impressions. Here's one that's a later one. And we look at, at this, um, this you can see is a, uh, uh, it's a river in, with a, a bunch of trees around it. And those trees are reflected in the, in the water. Uh, but the impression that you get from, from a picture like this is that he's moving so far away from the content, from representation. Uh, that he's moving much closer to what in the 20th century will be called uh, abstract art. So you know, similar to what uh, Whistler was doing with his uh, falling rocket. You know, he's moving in the direction of abstract art because if you're just looking at or thinking about paint on a surface and the effect that it has and using that as to express, uh, uh, you know, the impression you have, the, the response you have to, to looking at the world, then uh, you're moving in this, in this direction. Now let's look at uh, Auguste Renoir. Is another impressionist, uh, and uh, it has, there's another uh, aspect of of impressionism illustrated here is that is that um, there's not any modeling here. It's it's as if the forms that you see when you look at a thing uh, are are no longer like three dimensional forms. It's all uh, made as though it's a uh, it's just a bunch of color, and the figure in the ground. Are made of the same texture of broken color. Notice the way paint is applied is little dabs. And the difference between the figure and the ground, it just changes color here, changes hue, but the texture remains the same. And the figure itself doesn't have, you know, it has pattern within it, and there's pattern outside. So that the figure in the ground is the figure is blended to the ground and, and as made mean made of the same material, same the same sorts of hues. Um, often, <coughs> the difference between the figure and ground is not the, the there's just a different uh, uh, a different group of, of hues. Like the same the, the same hues might exist in the figure and the ground, um, like say like the blues. Uh, exist in the figure in the ground, uh, so that the so that the difference between figure and ground is 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 blurred. You notice that the edges are also blurred, and he, this artist is not giving you any indication of you know light and shadow or 
um, you know, any indication that this is a, uh, a the, the figure is a separate form than the ground. So that's that's Renoir uh, in you know one of his, his later pictures. But uh, he did he was a you know a classical classically trained artist. And here's an example where it's a similar sort of thing in terms of broken color and, and patches of of uh, of different color. And the figures are made up of you know in this case it, it does have dark and light to indicate forms, but the overall picture is one of um, you know it's different from an academic picture. In that it's um, it seems to be an, an, an accidental composition, you know. It's the composition doesn't look like um, you know a studied sort of formal composition that you would have in an academic picture. It looks very much like a snapshot, and photography was new. I mean, uh, it had been invented you know in the late uh, 1820s, early 1830s, and you know by the 1880s. You know, it's it's no longer, uh, you know, it's something that common people would have cameras, and and so they would people take snapshots of things. When you take a snapshot, you know, you don't study the composition the way an academic uh, artist would study a composition. You just point and click, uh, just like you do with uh, with your phone camera. And when you do that, you get pictures like this, where they're not studied, they're not symmetrical, and the the arrangement of things on the table. Are not the way they're arranged when an, when an artist you know makes a still life. They're just the way they happen to be. The way this person happens to be sitting backwards in the chair. Uh, this one happens to be turning away from the camera. Um, there's just a lot of accidental things that occur in a in a, in a snapshot, and and that's what they're mimicking when they're when they're making this sort of of uh, a picture. But this, even given that, the way this is rendered. Um, is more like an academic picture in terms of um, the forms. You know, you can see the forms of these arms, especially, and other things so to indicate. You can see some objects in space, but when you get to this one, also by Renoir, you lose even that. This has that sort of snapshot look, but in but instead of having forms in space, everything, you know, figure and ground are sort of uh, obliterated. So that it's difficult to see one thing from another. It's all just a blend. Um, what this this is, this one's called the um, Moulin de la Galette, and it's a it, it was a uh, sort of a, a restaurant dance venue place in Paris for where young people would go and and you know have a good time. And they're outdoors. There's a bunch of trees with the sunlight uh, filtering through the trees onto people. So you have these little dots. Of, of light, dappled light everywhere, and then you have people wearing patterned clothes. The, the, the ground here that you can see is also dappled light, and the, where the light is is a warm color, and where the shadow is is a cool color. So, so you have um, this dappling of light over all of the surfaces. So as to make a, is just sort of a, you know, a symphony of color. Just it's, it's, it's similar to, to uh, uh, Whistler's Falling Rocket, and it's just a bunch of paint on a surface without reference to, um, you know, individual figures and ground that you can see where the edges are, or it's just about the color and the the impression of that you get. I mean, you can imagine being in a place like this where there's lots of music and noise and and people moving, and and if you wanted to capture that, um, you couldn't do it in an academic way, and the and so that approach wouldn't work for, for this kind of picture. And, you know, it's a much more happier sort of picture with, you know, smiling faces and, and people having a good time. Um, these are portraits, by the way, of friends of, uh, of Renoir. Uh, but the others are just, it's just a, 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 a smattering, a, a, a confusion of things, which, you know, adds to that uh, you know, festive atmosphere of the thing. Look a little closer, you can see how the brushwork. It's all dabs of paint just smeared around in such a way so as to uh, lose the forms. 
see the, the, the way the, the dress here is treated is the same as the ground is treated. And this hair has the same texture as the ground. So he's not separating uh, one form from another or figure from ground at all. We saw something like this in Manet's uh, bar scene with the, with the girl. Um, where we just go, as you get farther and farther, it just becomes more like abstract paint dabs. Uh, but the, the Manet in that, at, in that painting was, was influenced by this sort of thing, even though he was a realist. Um, and and, uh, and he, he, never, he never showed with the Impressionists, so he's never counted among them, though he did use this style later in, in life. But remember that the realists, their subject matter was often um, social commentary of some kind, uh, you know, like Courbet and 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 and, and Millet and uh, the Gleaners and all that. Um, there, there's some sort of social commentary where there's, there's you know some sort of injustice that occurs in the world that they're they're pointing to. But the Impressionists didn't do that. There were there were political reasons. Uh, the political climate, I guess, of the time was such that. It, it was no longer fashionable to do that, and so the the impressionist typically um, did images of happy things. Uh, usually, the, the the young people at the time in Paris, you know, urban uh, professionals or urban, uh, you know, middle class people who would e either either their images of them in doing city things like this. Or going out into the country, but when they did, when they went out into the country, it, it wasn't like a rural picture, like like me as gleaners. It was more like um, city people going out on holiday, uh, on a day trip outside. The next artist is Edgar Degas, and uh, we'll look at a couple of things about his. Uh, Another aspect of, of Impressionism, he was in the group, but his are not so much about the, uh, the color, uh, you know, be, being a pretty color or candy-like colors. It's more about dark and light and, um, and forms in space. Like, you know, you can see uh, the volumes of things, but one thing that this does have, that the others I had, was that um, it looks like a snapshot. It looks as though you've You've taken a, a, a picture of a bunch of things that are moving around, and you just happen to get things like, you know, a face cut off or a body cut off, like this. Or these are these are the top ends of uh, bass violas, the little scroll on the top, as if there's an orchestra back down here, or you know, somebody carrying some some musical instruments, and they just happen to get stuck into the picture. And we're st we're on a stage with a, a bunch of ballerinas. And you know, I guess these are people. This they're they're doing rehearsal. This is not during a show. But the uh, you know the people are I guess they're auditioning or judges or coaches or whatever um, choreographers are sitting and watching. So it's just a here's, here's a girl who's yawning. You know that's the sort of thing you get in a in a snapshot. So he's uh, uh, he, he's trying to capture the energy of just a bunch of movement without um, doing the academic manner. Of, uh, of a study picture. But one thing that, uh, that, that is new <coughs> is Ed, Edgar Degas was, was a photographer and he, he would take pictures and here's some examples of, of a photograph and the, the painting that he made from the photograph. So using photographs as a, as a tool. This series here. This is a group of ballerinas similar to what we were just looking at, except the pose of this ballerina, you know, is, is this one, and then this one here is this one. It's a girl seen from back behind here, and there's another one here with her arm up. And so he's taking the, the photographs and composed them into a group that looks like a, a candid photograph. That is one where he just, he just takes what happens to be going on at the moment. So he's, he's, you, to, to, to do this, to take pictures and then compose them together or you know different different poses and, and put them together is kind of an academic thing. That is that academic artists would 
you know, draw from life and, and take those things and maybe composite them together to create a, a composition. But they would make a composition that would be, you know, a studied, balanced, you know, Renaissance type composition. But here, uh, Degas is putting them together in such a way as to make a, uh, just something that looked like a candid, a, a non-studied uh, group of group of figures. Uh, another thing that Degas did, this kind of picture, he did several bath pictures of women taking a bath in, a, in an interior. And these, this series of pictures, this is the one that you have on your list, uh, one of the influences for this was uh, Japanese prints. Now this, this is the one that I found, uh, though this is not the particular one. It happens to be uh, a bath here, but or, or a, you know a tub on the floor. But the perspective in Japanese prints was not the Western perspective. It was uh, it's much more unusual, um, and, and it, <clears throat> it's much more patterned. And you know it doesn't indicate space. Everything is is kind of flat, and this this notion of of having uh, Figures where there's lots of pattern on the ins on the inside of the figure with in the in the cloth, and that pattern looks very flat, and it's similar to pattern on the outside of the figure, so that the figure and ground are are unified in a kind of a a flat one flat pattern against another flat pattern. This is something that impressionists would also be influenced by. Uh, let's just go back to Degas' bath. This, when you think of it. Um, in terms of this this uh, this controversy between the impressionists and, and academic uh, artists, this is kind of like the kind of thing that would come out of an academic studio as a study. That is, the academic artists would study the figure. They would get live models and they would draw them and and use those in in pictures later. You know, they would take the the image from the from something that they studied and put it in another picture and then they make a finished picture from that. But this looks like a kind of a study for that, like it's, it's academic, except this is the finished work. Um, by the way, this is also a, it's not a painting, it's a, it's a drawing using pastels. Uh, but like the Impressionists, or like other Impressionist paintings, the, the figure and the ground are, are made of the same material. That is, the, the, uh, the strokes of the, in this case, chalk or, or pastels, you know, creates a, a texture in that the figure has the same texture. But his uh, his way of looking at the world here is different from that Renoir here, like this, where the form is gone. It's all, or at least the, the, the three-dimensionality of figures has gone in, into a, this texture of color. What he's done, Degas has done, is you see the form. You see the, the, the dark and the light. To, that creates a, a volume, but he's he's in addition to creating volume, he's also taking away the volume. That is, he's making the the, the circle that she makes continuous with the circle of the of the bathtub, this uh, pan shallow pan on the floor, uh, so so that they both together make a geometric shape. You know, contrasted against this geometric shape of this straight line here, which almost looks like it's a separate picture on this side and this side. They have bridged together with this brush going across. But the, um, this is like a shelf next to her. And, but the shelf is not seen, doesn't appear to be seen in front, exactly the same perspective. Like the angle that you're looking down at her doesn't seem to be right for this shelf. It, the way it's cropped is kind of odd. Uh, <coughs> kind of like a, uh, a snapshot has odd croppings. And the, and the, the pictures like a water picture, pitcher, and uh, some sort of metal pitcher here, are uh, uh, are seen from a, a different point of view than than the than the in the figure. These are things that come from uh, the way images or the objects are in in Japanese prints. So this has, this is taking, you know, it's 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 sort of a mashup between academic figure study. Uh, Japanese print and impressionist technique of breaking the forms into this texture. All those things put together. So the different, what I'm thinking is that the, the different impressionists um, have different ways of doing impressionism. 
you know, some of them are more about the forms. This one is about shape and, and, and line in addition to the form and texture. Others are just about light and color. Like this, like Matt, like Monet and Renoir. Or Renoir sometimes. Because this is this is also a Renoir, but it's you know, it, it has the it has the light and the color and the and the cropping that I was talking about. But but it also is, you know, Fender figures are rendered more more academically than others, um, and some of them, one of the things that that the impressionists did was that they refused to to show or to submit things to the academy because they wanted to be separate from the academy and wanted to create uh, a, an art that was uh, they wanted to have a following and having having the public um, you know accept them not doing something that was accepted by the Academy. This is also take a wonderful picture. A little newspaper there is wonderful. Uh, but that's not the one on your list. Okay, another another impressionist is uh, uh, Mary Cassatt, who's an American who lived in Paris and painted in Paris. And, uh, this is one that I put on your list. Uh, and look at um, this is a, 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 a called the child's bath. There's a mother and a, and, a, and, a, and a child. She's bathing her, and you know, similar to what um, what Degas is doing, but his is more of a study. Sort of, it's it's a it's an, an artist doing something, studying just pure form. With with Cassatt, who did many pictures of you know mothers with their children, um, you know, there there's more of more about the content, more about the storytelling, more about the the uh, um, the emotional response of, of knowing the intimacy between a mother and a daughter, and the and that and that we're sort of looking at them, uh, almost like you know you're peeking in on a, on a, on this moment, uh, kind of thing. But the way he's painted her, all these things. Look at the. You know, he does have some volume in the in the in the figure here, you know, with some dark and light, but there's not a whole lot of range between dark and light. Look at this different temperature change from one side to the other. Uh, but the the mother's dress made up of these patterns, uh, and those and there's very little indication of light and dark to see her volume. In fact, the 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 patterning of her dress seems to, to flatten her out into just a bunch of pattern, and you notice that the background also has pattern here and pattern here and pattern here and down here too. So that so that it all becomes uh, a series of patterns. Again, <coughs> the uh, the Japanese prints influence of this, but notice it's it's not like a copy of a Japanese print. You, know, you wouldn't mistake this for Japanese print, but it's it's just taking taking that odd point of view. Um, taking, you know, making the figure in the ground uh, relate to one another in terms of their pattern and, and also texture, you know, to, to solve essentially the figure and ground problem. And consciously solving the figure and ground problem is something that the Impressionists are doing that the um, academic artists aren't. That is, they're, they're, you know, they have a studied way of making pictures this formalistic and um, formulaic also. Um, but but it's not really about uh, it's not as though they're they're you know solving visual problems it's, as their, their main thing really is I would think story storytelling uh, in getting accepted and using and doing you know following all the rules of the academy to get their pictures in uh, into into the salon uh, rather than just being about um, painting and uh, expressing themselves and uh, solving visual problems. Okay, another artist named George Seurat. And uh, he's a little later. And after the, after the series of, of uh, Impressionist shows, um, the, the, art, the different Impressionists sort of moved in different directions. 
and the art, different artists coming in to the, to the group uh, also moving in different directions. So, and several of them are um, doing things that are outside of the original manifesto of the Impressionists. And so they are called the Post-Impressionists because they don't have anything in common other than that they come after the Impressionists, but, um, and that they are against the Academy, but they're all, they're, they have moved into different directions. Uh, George Surratt was, was an artist interested in light and depicting light, but not interested in going out into the landscape and painting directly what he saw in terms of an impression that is a, that is, you know, uh, that immediate spont spontaneous thing. Uh, George Surratt painted pictures very, very slowly, painstakingly, with lots and lots of very tiny dots. Um, you can see some of them here. Um, lots of little dots of color. Um, and the way it works is that it's not so much about you know, getting the impression of what you actually see in terms of, of, of the composition or the way the forms look, because this, this actually looks very artificial. It's called The Sunday Afternoon on the Isle of Le Grand Jacques, a, a typical sort of subject for, for Impressionists. That is, they would, you know, a, a, a Sunday um, holiday for the people who live in, in Paris who would come out and, you know, dress up and parade around you know, with their with their walking their dog, or in this case, their monkey here, taking their kids out uh, to the park. That's the sort of thing that the impressionists would paint. But George Seurat is just using that as a as a, a stepping off point to do what looks kind of like a, a scientific experiment about light and perception. Uh, what he did was these these tiny little dots of color are. Are meant to blend by putting several little different colors together. They blend into a new color from more from a distance, and the way that works is similar to the way um, printing works. Here's a uh, an example of a of a color picture printed where you can see the little dots. Uh, the way the way printing works is that they they use uh, dots of color uh, of four different colors. There's uh, called CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and, and black. And uh, they take a, a color image and separate it into those four different colors, and they print them as little dots. So here's those dots. Uh, you can see them. And they make little rosettes, these little little patterns as, they, as they, they're put together. If you've ever looked at uh, you know the photographs that are printed, and uh, you know with a magnifying glass, you see the little, the little blue dots in there. And what happens is that from a distance, they blend together to make to make color. And that's the way your eye works. It looks at little, you know, it, it, it looks at individual dots, individual um, um, color receptor receptors in your eye. You know, pick up each one, and, and your eye sort of blends them together. So he was working on theories of perspective, perspective, not perspective, but perception of light and how the eye, the eye perceives color and makes these very painstaking pictures that take him months and months and months to paint uh, in order to, to, to get these, um, to get this kind of color treatment. You know, the, the shadows, if you look in the shadows, you know, it has the same bunch of colors that everything else has. You know, they're all, uh, you know, it's only a very small number of colors, you know, primaries and secondary colors. And he's putting them together in such a way, like, like I'm sure even the, the red has some green in it. And even the, you know, the greens have some red in it. You know, in, in, and the effect is that it is to get this, this look. He was, he was the first to do this. It's called pointillism is the... Uh, is the is the term of you know, tiny little dots of color, but in his case they are to uh, the having the pure colors being right next to each other in such a way so that they they blend in your eye. So that's George Seurat. Here's another uh, example.
notice how the darks are not made with black. They're made with you know, darker hues, purples, dark blues. Okay, the next artist is uh, uh, Vincent Van Gogh, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, he was not an impressionist. He he he's called a post-impressionist. That is, he comes afterwards. Uh, he was a, a Dutch artist, and uh, he started out. He wasn't uh, classically trained. He was uh, uh, just somebody who wanted to be an artist. So he tried very hard to learn on his own, studying art from from other artists, and going to museums, uh, copying things, drawing things. Uh, and over a very short time, he became extremely adept at, at, uh, at painting. But because he was not trained and because he was doing things in a, um, you know, his, his own idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic manner, uh, he came up with images that no one else had. You know, there's nothing else like this in the history of art. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you look at this, this is a, a landscape called The Starry Night, uh, one of his most famous pictures. Um, uh, I guess it does have something in common with, with Dutch landscapes. I mean, there are Dutch landscapes we saw. Um, maybe we didn't. Maybe in the Baroque class we saw. Uh, the Dutch landscape painters, they have you know, a low horizon. They have you know, little, little trees and, and houses in, down here, and they have a sky up here. But what's going on in this picture is nothing like what's, what's going on in, in, in any landscape before, even... even um, like uh, John Constable's uh, 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 studies, you know, aren't like this. It's, this this is this reproduction is the biggest picture I've ever had. It's 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 thirty thousand pixels across, uh, so we can look very close at it. Let's see. Yeah, even that close. So we can see what his paint looks like. One thing you can see the canvas peeking through in places. There's a light color, that's the canvas. You can see how he applied his paint. It's it's almost a frenetic, uh, energy filled uh, motion of, of uh, the paintbrush just sort of scribbling and dabbing, squirting paint out like maybe directly from the tube. Uh, just brushing it around, mixing it on the canvas itself to create these, these wild pictures that are just, you know, diametrically opposed from anything that you can imagine that, that was academic. I mean, the fact that he's not trained, he's not trying to represent anything like it looks in the real world. He's essentially using paint for emotionally expressive purposes. Look into that little dot of red in the middle. And this is a, a, a starry night. This is, this is, you know, the night sky. But in his mind, you know, the night sky is just filled with color and filled with, with movement. I mean, look at the, the textures that he's created. To represent the night sky, just these swirls of color, and he's making them with the movement of his brush strokes, like the dabs of, of, you know, much bigger dabs than any of the impressionists had, I can think. You know, these long strokes that create a flow, and the flow goes around the shapes. This is a, this is the moon here, and it's and it's shining brightly, and and the shine of it is created with. Uh, these, these, the movement of the strokes that go parallel or, or concentric to the moon here goes and it uh, interferes with this concentric uh, ones around this star. And the, you see how the flow of brush strokes move around all the forms, um, creating you know, an energy in the sky that is not about perception at all. Even though Seurat and, and, and Van Gogh are both categorized as post-impressionists. They have nothing in common. I mean, Seurat was more 
was a, was a scientific sort of study of light, and Van Gogh is a um, you know much more expressively emotional thing, nothing to do with light or what you actually see. You know, this is this is not anything like what you what you see. This is, uh, you know, his own personal uh, mind and his own personal emotional spontaneity in application of color. Okay, so he also painted a lot of a, a lot of uh, self portraits, like Rembrandt did, um, and he was probably influenced. He's they're both Dutch. Uh, and his he was also very poor and he didn't have models most of the time so he would look in the mirror to to have something to paint he painted quite a lot in a very short amount of time um, but these portraits are like Rembrandt portraits in that they look like they're almost you know, psychological studies he's looking at himself and you can see how he changes over the course of time and the in the different um, uh, effects upon him that, that his life turned. He has was a hugely tragic life. Died young. Uh, he was he was insane, or he would have what we would call now in schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or some something like that. That he was that you know he had he had medicine for, and sometimes was off his medicine, and so he would he would have insane uh, uh, episodes in his life. And looking at knowing his story and looking at a picture like this, you know why. Is the is the background doing this? Like why? Why? I mean, he has his face, and his his face has a, you know, he's studied and want, wants to represent his face, uh, you know, in in a you know sort of uh, uh, I guess a primitive version of realism. That is, he wants to show you exactly what he within the the limits of his ability to represent forms and represent reality. He's there's a clear image of his own face staring into a mirror. But looking at the background, why does he do this? I mean, this, this can be nothing other than, you know, his, his state of mind is being represented. You know, a psychological uh, uh, turmoil that's, that's going on in him is going on around, going on in him is going on around him in the picture. So what is being depicted in the picture is something, some inner, inner emotion that he has. And that is completely new in the history of art. There's no one before him doing anything like that. Here's another, uh, one of his last ones. He painted well, while he was in a, a sanitarium in, in uh, uh, rural France uh, called the Wheatfield, Wheatfield with Crows. This is a, a, an extraordinary picture. I've, I've seen this and it's just standing in front of this, the the energy coming off of it. This the relationship between blue and yellow here. This gold color, uh, complementary aspect of going on. It's, it's, it's just this thing is sings loudly. He also did drawings. Uh, as an example uh, of his drawings, where he uses a a reed pen. I guess it's a reed pen. That is, you know, he dips, you know, something made of like a like a bamboo pen that's is sharp, it's sharpened into a pen point, but it's not very sharp, and is you know dips it in ink. Uh, and notice how he he he's dealing with textures. The textures are in place of the color, and so he has various different kinds of textures going on, and each one uh, is like a different color in a color picture. There's another one. A graphite one, I think. I guess it's graphite. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I mean, but just look at the. It's it's all all about the varying textures in order to represent uh, a landscape. It's just a wonderful thing that he did. Um, here's an example of oh, one of the portraits he made. Many made many portraits. Uh, uh, but it, it has in the background images of Japanese prints. And here's 
examples that these 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 artists at the time really was very popular to collect Japanese prints and uh, be influenced by them. Okay, the next one, post impressionist, is Paul Cezanne. Cezanne is also also uh, he was a post impressionist, but he had been he exhibited as an as an impressionist in the original uh, impressionist exhibitions. Uh, his thing is that uh, he would he he worked isolated from from the others. Uh, his his interest was in the forms of things. He did still lives in landscapes and figure painting and uh, and portraits. But he would take he would do the same image over and over and over. Um, but in, unlike uh, unlike Monet. Uh, Who's interested in the light on things? His his is more interested in, in the relationship of color and form, using using uh, the, the forms of objects, um, and and simplifying the forms into like geometric shapes. Here we have the, the spheres of all the um, apples on the table. Um, the work that's on your list is called uh, Mount Saint Victoire. Which was you know near his home uh, in Provence, I think, and uh, he he did he did a picture of this mountain you know many many times over the course of his life, and uh, uh, you know it's very much like land you know traditional landscapes, except that what he's done is he's not looking at in terms of representing the mountain or representing the things that are in the valley or the sky or or the tree. What he's doing is is making a painting. Is like he's he's using the what he's seeing out there as a stepping off point to um, making this new world, which is the painting world. And in that, he's reproducing those forms, simplifying them, turning them into a kind of kind of a facets of his uh, brushstrokes. His brushstrokes are uh, more like done with a, a flat brush rather than a round brush. So he's 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 things turn into facets. Uh, especially things like you know buildings, you know uh, just a few strokes here and there to to create um, uh, these these new forms that are on the canvas uh, that are his response to the ones that he's seeing out in the world. He had a very limited palette of colors, and he used that same palette of colors uh, in in every picture. And if you go to a museum and see a Cezanne, you recognize it just by this palette of colors, this suite of, of greens, blue-greens, and warms and cools. Notice that the, the same bunch of colors is in every bit. doesn't matter where it is. The, the same colors that you see up here are also down here. There's just different amounts of them or different strengths of them. Notice how he's dealing with the seeing, seeing the, 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 the mountain here is a figure in the background, is a ground. But, you know, in order to make sure that, uh, say, that the, the branches of this tree aren't, don't overlap there so as to make the figure uh, seem distant. He wants to see, you see the figure here as on the surface and that the ground is on the surface. He makes the the tree follow along the form of the of the of the the edge between the figure and the ground, so that the so to emphasize that as a surface line rather than as something very far away. So he's not looking at this in terms of depicting things that are far away and bringing them up here, uh, and so that you you get the 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 feeling of what you see when you see this scene. He's not doing that. He's not doing what, like say, Monet did with the impression sunrise, where he's he's giving you the impression of what it would look, be like if you were there. Uh, it's more like he's more more of an intellectual picture about the forms on the surface and uh, color on the surface and line and movement, uh, and and he's and he's dealing with the visual problems uh, rather than about impressions. Uh, Cezanne is going to be hugely influ influential to the artists of the 20th century, especially uh, Matisse and uh, Picasso. 
and Brock and Cubism, those movements in the early part of the 20th century, they will look to Cezanne as their, their mentor. Um, the last artist is a sculptor named Auguste Rodin. And uh, his one of his most famous picture, uh, pieces is the, is the Thinker. You may have seen this one before. Uh, this, was, uh, this figure was designed for, to go over the gates of hell, uh, which we was commissioned to do. It was a big you know, couple of doors with uh, imagery on it from Dante's Inferno. And this would be a figure up on that door you know, judging the, the people in the Inferno. Rodin was a classically trained sculptor, and he worked as an assistant for other classical sculptors. But in his own work, um, um, he, you know, he had his own vision, and he, and he, which was different from academic um, uh, sculpting. Academic sculpting were was much more formal, much more like, you know. Uh, what we saw, I guess, in the neoclassical period. I mean, it hadn't, hadn't changed much. It was about, you know, study and, and formalism and artificial idealism. But um, Rodin's approach to sculpting was much more, um, much more like realists, that is, representing the figure exactly as it is, uh, representing in, in not idealizing things, making things... Uh, not have that balance and symmetry or whatever that that uh, that classical and and academic sculptors would have, but making things that that were more expressive. So he was using sculpting similar to what Van Gogh was doing with paint, in that he was being more expressive, used the figure to express, um, <coughs> sort of like kind of like my, like my Michelangelo would, did in his later work. That is Michelangelo's later work was was much more expressive and 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 far removed from from his high Renaissance days. Um, the work that we have on our list for Rodin is called the Burgers of Calais. This was a, a subject that was commissioned by the city of Calais in in, in France, I guess, in the north western coast of France, uh, and they wanted to have a a, a sculptor a sculpture to commemorate an event that had occurred centuries before during the Hundred Readers' War, you know, between 14, 1300s, uh, a war with, between France and England, where the English king um, had invaded France and had, uh, uh, had Calais under siege. And uh, he ordered the whole, the whole uh, population killed uh, unless six people uh, would come and offer themselves to be to be killed in, instead of the whole population, and so uh, the burghers, that is the the, uh, the the townspeople's leaders, like a burger would like like a mayor, board of aldermen, you know, that kind of people, the leaders of the town, uh, small town, um, came out dressed in rags and and uh, carrying the keys to the city, and. Uh, the, the, the king had them, you know, ordered them uh, killed, except the queen, you know, told them to, to spare their lives because they were so, so brave and, and uh, you know, offering themselves to sacrifice for, the, for, their, for their city. So um, this was the subject. And the, the Calais, you know, the, the people of Calais who wanted, who wanted this represented were picturing an academic image, something that was heroic, that is something on a big high pedestal with lots of heroic type, type figures. You can imagine it, you know, the, 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 the way, the way uh, uh, Canova would, would, would have done it, like, um, you know, look up Canova or any of the, the uh, academic, academic sculptures of the, of the, of the 1800, um, you know, heroic pictures. Uh, of, of things. Uh, that's not what the way Rodin saw it. Uh, Rodin got the commission and you know reluctantly they, they accepted, they allowed him to make this and then and they were, there were a lot of people who opposed to it. He, he made this uh, the images of, of uh, the burghers 
not as heroic people, but as uh, em emotional studies. They're each one sort of isolated. Uh, there's six figures standing, uh, made in bronze, and they're uh, dressed in rags. They're over life size. They're like six and a half feet tall. And he, uh, and they also have distortions in them, like really, really large, long arms here and big hands. Um, and so as to exaggerate their expression of, of, of despair that they're all, all feeling, but they're all feeling sort of as individuals, not as a group. They're all standing around as if they're walking almost in, in a circle, uh, like prisoners. Here's another image of it. Um, and instead of being up on a high pedestal, uh, emphasizing their, their specialness and, and, and uh, heroic nature, um, they're, they're on a very low platform that you can walk around. And it's entire, in, in intended to be walked around and seen. And when you walk around them, it's like you are, you are among them. You're, you're, um, you're on the same level that they are. And you can see all of the different expressions of the, each individual sort of looking inward and feeling and expressing that feeling of, of despair and and that each is sort of you know wrestling with himself the idea of, of they're about to go to their death. Notice you know, the non-academic representation of the figures. They, you know, they don't look, they're not idealized. In fact, they're they're made deliberately kind of you know kind of ugly or or uh, you know, unideal, you know, as individuals, um, distorted a bit, rags, expressive hands with the giant that grip. Uh, Um, Rodin made the, the way I've explained before. You know, when you make sculpture, you make an original uh, out of clay, and then uh, it's bronze. That is, uh, uh, devices are put around it in such a way that you can you can uh, turn it into a copy of the original in bronze. And so there are many different copies of this in different museums around the world, uh, because even though the the, uh, the original people who commissioned it weren't, weren't particularly happy with this because they were expecting something something academic. You know, once it became famous, you know, they were, they loved it and they made, you know, made lots of different copies of it uh, because it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. It's, it's one of his most famous uh, pieces and he, uh, um, it moved art in, in a completely different, different direction. Like he's the first of the of the modern uh, sculptors, you know, the sculpture in the 20th century is going to move in this direction. It's going to move, you know, far away from from the academic tradition. All right, that's enough.